September 2018, and I have just finished my formal fieldwork in Tyree, interviewing residents and diaspora tourists about their experiences and perceptions of heritage in the island. I'm in the neighbouring island of Col, teaching on a field course for a group of undergraduate anthropology students from Durham University. A colleague tells the group about a nice ruin not too far away, and I find myself unsettled, even disturbed by this phrasing, but I don't fully understand my own reaction. I write about it in my field diary and then move on. A few months later, in February 2019, I find myself uploading pictures to the Ruination and Decay gather Gallery. The images have been sent to me by colleagues without headings, and so I am typing general captions before uploading them to the website. Ruined House, Isle of Lewis, I type, before moving on to the next picture, one that had been sent to me by a respondent in my own research. In the image, I see a few low walls of stones which offer only the barest indication of ever having been a dwelling. This is the image here. Ruined home, Tyree, I type, without thinking. I realise in this moment that the way I view the landscape of Tyree has been fundamentally altered by the stories, emotions and ideas I encountered during my research. I am no longer able to see these ruins as only ruins or even as ruined houses. They have been forever transformed in my eyes into homes. In Scotland, ruined houses and tourism appear to be inseparable. Scroll through Visit Scotland's Instagram feed and you will find image after image after image of houses in various states of ruination and decay. All of them, over the past few years at least, seem to have been taken in the Highlands and Islands and are now used to advertise tourism to the region. Here we see ruined houses in Harris, Scarp, Orkney, Shetland and elsewhere used to, as to advertise Scotland to potential tourists with hashtags like abandoned places and captions like who would want to stay in a house like this and loving this photo or great shot. This is recognisable as a specific kind of tourist gaze which has been labelled ruin porn the concept and activity of ruin porn has become mainstream globally. One recent academic publication on the topic described its particular features. And she says, the term ruin porn, dubious and insufficient though it may be, is more accurate than, say, ruin art, because it is grounded and warehoused in obsession. It allows us to view, as if in a museum, something uncompromisingly real and consequential, but without having to engage completely with the dire consequences it realistically provokes. This definition certainly seems to describe the behaviour of many people fascinated by the ruins which are present across the Highland, uh, Highlands and Islands, and indeed seems an accurate description of some of the marketing techniques used by Visit Scotland. The image of the Highlands and Islands as wild and empty has persisted in the tourist gaze since at least the Victorian era. The development of what we might now call ruin porn is an unsurprising development in this context. Yet the growing use of the term ruin porn overlooks other important perspectives which might account for some people's fascination with ruins. Basu reminds us the sites of cleared or abandoned settlements in the Highlands may be regarded as places of pilgrimage. They can also be seen as sites of collective memory for both visitors and local residents, as Elizabeth Ritchie, my colleague at the Centre for History, highlights in her excellent open access paper on wild land. She says, many residents of coastal villages and crofting townships, as well as descendants of people who migrated away, know where their families lived prior to their removal. Some can even take you to the ruins of their ancestors' homes, point out the lines of their fields and tell their stories. For many locals, these places are not wild. Rather, they are deserted, made desolate, no longer productive, no longer supporting a population. And this is one of my participants, Archie, at the ruins of his ancestral home in Tyree. In other words, some people, both residents and visitors, may not approach a ruin in the spirit of ruin porn, that is, without having to engage completely with the dire consequences it realistically provokes. Some of these people are in fact living with the consequences of such ruination and decay.
They may attach very different meanings to these ruins across the Highlands and Islands, which are not seen as though through the glass of a museum, but experienced as something personal, affective, and deeply significant. In a recent article about Uist, Magnus Course writes of a ruined house where occasionally tourists photograph it for a particular kind of aesthetic, the old range cooker, the broken detritus of domestic life, and the various Marian images. But for the people who grew up around the house, its memories are of the people and the changes it stands for, and its demise holds little aesthetic value. Ishbel tells me that the house looks so sad and empty that she can barely bear to see it, so happy and full of life as it once was. In this seminar, I'd like to present some findings from my research, which illustrate how diaspora tourism might act as a counterweight to the ruin porn trend and the narrative surrounding it. Rather than gazing at ruination and decay from a detached perspective, as if in a museum, in some cases, diaspora tourists are part of an active process of heritage work, which helps to write people and their lives back into a landscape, which is often portrayed from the outside as lifeless. Some diaspora tourists even restore houses associated with their ancestors or work to prevent them falling into disrepair. While diaspora tourists are often stereotyped as overly romantic or sentimental, I would also like to suggest that sometimes their attachment to ruined homes and their attempts to understand the lives of the people who lived there may actually reflect the heritage meanings attached to such ruins by residents themselves. I'll begin by discussing previous research into diaspora tourism in more depth, and I'll explain some of the key terms I used throughout this paper, which are drawn mainly from the fields of heritage studies and tourism studies. Then I'll introduce you to the specific context of Tyree before describing how I approached my research. My findings are drawn from 18 months of multi-sided ethnographic research focused on Tyree. I interviewed both residents and diaspora tourists and conducted participant observation while living in the island at Tyree Association events in Glasgow and in social media groups. As I present my findings, I will resist the temptation to try to summarize what are diverse and individual experiences under a singular narrative. And I hope that much of this material will speak for itself. However, I would like to suggest that there is a common thread between them, a thread that which connects not only tourists, but also residents to the literal and metaphorical ruins of the past. In the process of visiting ruins and reconstructing narratives about their former inhabitants, such sites are transformed from ruins to be gazed upon, as if in a museum, into something quite different. Let's turn to look in more detail at some key terms. In Scotland, the term ancestral tourist is widely used and recognisable. <coughs> it is defined by Visit Scotland as a visit to Scotland Whole, partly or wholly motivated by the need to reconnect with your Scottish ancestors or roots. Visit Scotland declared both 2009 and 2014 as a year of homecoming for such ancestral tourists, marked by tourism events such as Highland Games, a parade up the city's Royal Mile and a clan plaid pageant on the castle Esplanade. Ancestral tourists are encouraged to walk in the footsteps of your ancestors. My study was at first focused on ancestral tourism, and indeed when I wrote the title of this seminar earlier this year, I was still using the term. However, during the process of researching and analysing this material, I became convinced that the term diaspora tourism is more helpful as it is a broader term used to describe the tourism activities produced, consumed, and experienced by people in diaspora. Diaspora tourists travel to their perceived homeland in the hope of discovering more about themselves, their ancestry, their heritage, their families, and their extended communities. I recognize that there are difficulties with the term, not least the fact that some of these visitors may not perceive themselves to be tourists at all, I understand such categories as contingent and flexible, but for the purposes of this discussion, I include as a di diaspora tourist, anyone who has visited the island temporarily because of a family connection, having never lived there as a full-time resident themselves. The concept of diaspora tourism 
more accurately reflects the sense of imagined community which many of my respondents refer to as the Tyree diaspora. This is a community which encompasses not only former islanders and others in Scotland with Tyree connections, but also a worldwide network of people who, in the common parlance of my respondents, belong to Tyree. Whether these people are in Glasgow or Guelph, Sydney or Seattle, their connection to the island is an important and actively maintained part of their cultural heritage. Those who spoke to me considered the act of visiting the island as a particularly, particularly important heritage practice, a way to reconnect with their ancestors and their cultural heritages. Many set out to find the specific places where their ancestors lived, which are often in ruins if they haven't disappeared completely. While this was certainly experienced as one of the most significant moments in a diaspora tourism journey, it should be understood in the context of the multiple ways in which diaspora tourists engage with their heritages. In Tyree, those based beyond the island engage with and reconnect to their heritages in wide-ranging ways, through email lists, websites, Facebook groups, Tyree gatherings and commemoration events out with the island, and by keeping in touch with Tyree residents and island news. Taken together, these activities can be considered as what Dennis Byrne calls heritage work. Byrne reminds us that local people are engaged, as we heritage professionals are, in the self-conscious, reflexive business of producing their heritage. This might also be described as unofficial heritage, or heritage from below. This is the lens through which I approach diaspora tourism visits to ruins not as a single event, a physical visit which takes place and then is over, but as part of an ongoing process of meaning making, which takes place in a broader context of diverse and relational heritage work on and off the island. The ways in which diaspora, tourism, the way in which diaspora tourists describe their visits to ruined houses allow us to understand some of the heritage values which underpin diaspora tourism visits and broader engagements with ancestral heritage. Caitlin Sylvie and Tim Edensor explain, attitudes to ruins and ruination reveal social and cultural values and commitments that become legible through the different narratives that ruins are asked to carry. Before turning to consider the narratives given to ruins by diaspora tourists to Tyree, and what they might reveal about the meanings such visitors attach to their heritages, let me first introduce you to the island and explain why diaspora tourism is a significant part of life for, for residents there. Tyree is an island on the outermost edge of the Inner Hebrides in the west of Scotland. Travel to Tyree can be challenging, unreliable and time consuming but it is undeniably beautiful. Most striking is the sheer number and beauty of sandy beaches found on every side of the island. The landscape is green and fertile, and the distinctive Hebridean macher along the coast bursts to life with colorful wildflowers in the summer months. Measuring just 12 by five miles, the highland had a population of over 4,000 in the 1840s, but today it is home to around 650 people. At the time of the 1841 census, the population of Tyree stood at 4,391 people. By the next census, a decade le later, it had fallen to 3,709, as entire families and hundreds of people left. Some went to the mainland, especially to Glasgow, and a fraction went to Australia. But most travelled to Canada in ships such as the Conrad and the Charlotte. Emigration remains a contemporary challenge for the island as the population continues to fall. Over 100 people left the island between 2001 and 2011, a decline of 15%. For islanders today, emigration is not simply a distant historical event, but a significant issue in the present. My research focuses on the experiences of visitors and residents at two Tyree homecomings for people with connections to the island, which were organised by islanders in 2006 and 2016. 
Tyree's homecoming was called Avuain, or the harvest, because the traditional name for people from Tyree is clan and Yorna, or children of the barley. Choosing the name Avuain was a deliberate reference to the dispersal of Tyree people around the world and a celebration of their return as lost children of the island. As one respondent put it, you know how, like, the head of the corn breaks and all the wee bits go all over. That's everybody going all over the world. That's why we did the sheaf, that we could bring them back and try to get it all together again. The name of Uwain placed the Gaelic language and culture at the centre of the event, as Gaelic and the living traditions carried through the language remain significant for islanders today. My research explored perceptions of heritage more generally and did not specifically focus on attitudes to ruins, but ruins of ancestral homes emerged as an important theme in my interviews with, ancestral tur with diaspora tourists and appeared to be particularly significant during their first visit to the island. I'll now turn to share some of the thoughts that were shared with me by diaspora tourists to Tyree. For many of the diaspora tourists I interviewed, Finding the ruin of the house their ancestors lived in was one of the most meaningful and emotional moments of their visit to Tyree. Archie, who lives in Glasgow, told me about the importance of getting a feel for the place as a diaspora tourist. I asked him what he meant and he said, well, for me, when you know you've got a direct family connection, I take a lot from actually physically being able to stand in the environment that you know that they lived in. It was the same visiting Tyree as well. I had this pull to actually go to the place to stand in the, even if it's just the ruins, which in many cases, well, in most cases, it was for me. To stand in the ruins of the places where you know your family have lived, so as that when you're standing in the threshold of a doorway, even if it's a ruin, you know you're looking out to exactly the same scenery as they would have looked out at. I don't know. In that moment, your connection to them is almost closer, or it feels closer to me anyway. This experience of feeling a sense of connection with ancestors by standing in a ruin associated with them was a common theme. Um, and the next few quotes are um, under pseudonyms. So Sophie told me, I felt a real connection with my ancestors who had lived there. A real connection, looking out at what they looked at. There is an old stone ruin there. It's not one that my own ancestors would have lived in. That's all already totally gone. But it is an old ruin which was passed down through my relatives. It was a combination of the two things. Seeing an old ruin where some of my relatives had lived, seeing an actual house they had lived in, even though it was tumbled down, and looking out at the ocean through their eyes, and what I could see of the island from that point of view gave me this very, very close connection. That was the high point of my whole time that I spent in Tyree in 2006. This sense of connection was often attributed to seeing through their eyes or looking at exactly the same scenery they would have looked out at. And this experience was not limited to ruined houses, but also to old cemeteries where ancestors are known to be buried. The language used by Luke to describe his experience at a graveyard echoed Archie's and Sophie's, um, their language as they described the ruins of their ancestors' homes, again emphasising the importance of seeing the world through the eyes of his ancestors. So I asked Luke, how did you find it to return and, sta and stand over the graves of your ancestors? And he said, well, I just find it, it's intriguing because, you know, they had been there, they had seen those sites, they had lived there, they had, you know, their children were born there, they buried their dead there. For each of these respondents, ruins and graveyards were experienced as liminal spaces, where a connection to ancestors could be accessed more easily. For others, simply being in the land or, the cem or a cemetery connected to ancestors evoked a sense of home. Rachel told me, I think the main thing is finding your own ancestral home, explaining that she felt a particularly strong connection to the land. I asked her, what did it feel like to find the place where your ancestors had come from? And she told me, well, I guess it makes you feel like you're home. I feel so very lucky to have been able to go to Tyree, number one, to make connections to people and to stand on the land that was your ancestors who were born in the 1700s. To me, it's just amazing. 
And not only was there the land, there was the cemetery right on the land. So my people are there. Jessica first came to Tyree in the 1980s, and she also emphasised the importance of knowing the specific places where her ancestors came from. She explained that this helped to situate diaspora tourists, both connecting them to other members of the diaspora and to residents. She told me, if you say you're from Rig, then ah, that means something, not only on Tyree, but for the descendants of emigrants. If they know that their families had links to Rig, then they say, ah, okay, that place has significance for me, right? And I asked, so in your experience for other Tyree people living abroad, there's a degree of locality beyond just the island, island, right down to that degree of specificity. She said, yes, they do, yes, I think so, if they have any depth of knowledge of Tyree. There are lots of people around the world who have a vague notion that somebody in their family came from Tyree, and that's about as far as it goes. And then there are other, people, other folks who say, my family lived in Scaranish and my great-grandfather was a sealer and he left in this year and ended up in Australia. That's just an example I'm, I'm creating. So the level of knowledge varies, but I think in terms of placing people and identifying people, where you are from on Tyree makes a big difference because it's linked to local family histories. Where a specific ruin could not be found, the township most associated with ancestors seemed to take on even greater significance. For example, Jill could not find the exact place where her ancestors lived and told me about her first visit to the island. We rented a car and drove around and talked to as many people as we could. We were really hoping to find out where my people had lived, but we were totally unsuccessful, except for knowing it was the name of the township. That was all we knew. And I asked her, did that spoil your experience at all, Jill? No, 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 no. It just made me want to come back, that's all. The people were so lovely. It was this person and this person who had a conversation about who they could send us to, who might be able to help us. You know, we got such a warm welcome. Although Jill could not find the specific place where her ancestors lived, she was able to identify the township where they had lived. She gathered sand and stones from the nearest beach and has put it in a place in her home where, she says, <coughs> I look at it every day. She told me that she feels a special connection with both other members of the diaspora and residents who are connected to that township. Nadine was in a similar position, unable to locate the exact spot where her ancestors had lived. Yet she told me about being shown a ruin in the township where her ancestors came from. Even though she knew it was not where her own ancestors had lived, she described having an intense reaction to it. She said, he, old, uh, he showed us where an, old, where, an old, where an old croft had been. And so it was just, it was almost spiritual, like really. I mean, I know that sounds dramatic, but it really was. Knowing that her ancestors came from this township gave her a sense of connection. And she told me, it's a phenomenal experience to walk where they walked. It's just phenomenal. For all of the respondents I have discussed here, making a connection to a ruin or township was experienced as an important moment in a longer journey of reconnecting to the island and its heritage. Even where a ruin associated with a family member could not be found, by identifying a township or ruins associated with ancestors, respondents described being able to access a sense of connection to their ancestors by situating themselves and their families in the social history of that township, or by trying to recreate what their ancestors might have seen. Through reconnecting with ruins, even those not known not to be connected to their own families, but located in the township where they had lived, these diaspora tourists have inscribed their family connections into the heritage landscape of the island. By telling the stories of the people who lived in these ruins, and by valuing the remains they left behind, the values and meanings diaspora tourists perform at such sites are not simply nostalgic, but are also about actively connecting with and writing themselves into the present and future of the island. I also spoke to diaspora tourists who had closer connections to the island, 
even inheriting or pur purchasing houses associated with their ancestors. For some, the efforts to prevent such houses falling into disrepair were significant. For example, Fiona told me she had visited regularly as a child, but as an adult found herself coming to the island less. However, because of her family connection to the island, she actively worked to ensure that the house did not fall into disrepair. She told me, I still maintained that connection with the house. We all contributed to getting it done up, to bring water into the house and to redo the wiring and put in it. As we can see from the Tyree Place Names database, ruins and genealogical connections continue to be remembered and marked by island residents. With emigration a continuing challenge for the island, many residents are sensitive to the possibility of ruination and in their attitudes towards ruins, they may share more in common with diaspora tourists than we might think at first glance. Let's return to the Isle of Col, where in September 2018, I find myself reacting in a surprising way to a colleague's suggestion that I visit what he called a nice ruin. I was unsettled by this phrasing, but didn't understand why. Later that week, we had a guided tour from a local resident, and I remarked to a colleague that I enjoyed having someone who knew the area well show us around. She turned to me and said something that in that moment helped me to understand my own research and its relationship to ruins a little better. She said, yes, stories make places peopled. Stories get in your bones. The stories I've heard during my research from residents and from diaspora tourists have gotten in my bones. That's why, when writing a caption to accompany some old ruins sent to me by a participant, I find myself writing, ruined home, Tyree. The way I see the heritage landscape of the island, and of the Highlands and Islands more broadly, has fundamentally changed because of the stories I have been told by both diaspora tourists and island residents. As one of my first interviewees said prophetically, as he leaned forward in his chair towards me for emphasis, Going around Tyree, you'll go round it with a different eye after what I've told you. I have to admit, he was absolutely right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Okay, thank you so much um, for, that, for that absolutely uh, fascinating talk about Tyree and heritage and diaspora and tourism and everything. I just wondered if anybody had a question or a comment or indeed anything that might link our two presentations today, the, the kind of musical aspect and what Joe was talking about. Yes. Um, that was really good, thank you. Um, one of the things that I think is quite interesting about the respondents you have in your interviews was that there is a primacy of the senses and people talk about seeing with ancestors' eyes and mm. looking at the same views, even though actually the views probably quite significantly altered. Um, and uh, I was kind of thinking, obviously, because of my own research, uh, you know, arguably drinking whiskey on Tyree <laughs> would be as much an engagement with what your ancestors did, it's a big part of the heritage. And um, so, do um, Avun, do do they encourage people to sort of bring in all their senses and to experience the island in these ways? And, and if not, do you think they, they could structure people's engagement with their heritage in a way that is less voyeuristic? And should they? Mm. I think absolutely, thanks for the question. I think absolutely um, they encourage a very embodied participation. So they had things like croft tours. So they actually went and there, there's um, video images of them you know, next to the the sheep in a you know in a barn or a buyer or somewhere, um, and so obviously that's going to engage all of your senses. And they had things like house keelies where they did sit around and have a dram. Music was a huge part of it, obviously it being Tyree, um, and so that's a very embodied experience. And I, I didn't have time to go into it today, but absolutely th this idea of just the visual it goes way beyond that um, for these people certainly. Just a wee comment. Um, trying desperately to think of how to connect this talk with the, the music we just heard, <laughs> but when you're talking about that liminal space, yeah. the in-between, and that sense of value gained from, you know, going to an actual place, um, I was trying, I was thinking about the sound of the instruments, and that move between um, a kind of, it's not a dead sound, but a, a non-reverb sound becoming the reverb, mm -hmm. and that sort of, uh, that space for moving from one to the echoey sound, um, I suppose a question I would ask uh, is, you probably 
little bit, there's a sense of the elegy, um, the sense of loss of um, a kind of lamentation tradition mm. in, in, in sort of Highlands and Islands communities. Do you think this heritage work is, it, there's a sense of moving on and building from that sort of elegy tradition, or do you think it's still very strong? Yeah, I think, um, thanks for the question, I think that um, we also know that this connection to ancestors is very deeply rooted in, in Gaelic culture and tradition, and I think it's as much about um, recognising their lives and recognising what has gone before in order to inform the present and the future. But going back to the homecoming events that they had, it was very much about, as I said, they had tours of, of you know, crofts and they had house keelies. It was very much about showcasing the island as it is today and the way residents live today, as well as looking back. Um, and my sense that it was, was that it was very much a celebration rather than um, a lamentation. Uh -huh. um, and, and the other thing I would say is there was, I really didn't pick up much on this kind of victimhood mentality, which you often hear about when it comes to ancestral tourists in the Highlands and Islands. Um, the clearances obviously were mentioned, but they weren't as significant in Tyree as they were across the Highlands and Islands. And it, it wasn't a narrative that these visitors imposed upon the island at all. They seemed to understand that it was a... Um, complex story. Okay. Could I could I maybe ask? Um, sorry, I'm just, I was going to say, could I ask maybe Peter and Anna Wendy and Miriam maybe to come back on Paul's notion of that mm. that music, that ethereal, wonderful music, as a sense of going beyond, as a sort of I don't know, as a strategy encountering loss or something uh -huh. like that. I don't know. Is that is that anything that that you find a sort of resonating idea as far as your improvisation of that that piece is concerned. Oh. Can't hear anything. Still here. Hello, are you still here, Peter? Possibly not. Possibly not. Okay, I'm I'm very sorry. I cut somebody off. Then who was that? Just me, sorry, thank you, Leslie. It was, they were both fantastic things, but Joe, your talk really has resonated with me concepts of persistence of place, especially when you were talking about the people coming back to the island, buying these houses that are in advanced ruination, but when they're renovating them, they're not renovating them to the level they would have been when their ancestors lived in them. They're sort of they're adding to them, they're modernising them, but they're keeping the past in, in the heart of the building. So remembering and creating their own memories and biographies, which will be in turn remembered by future descendants. And I just, I just wonder what you thought that, because this whole persistence of place, the song that these people sometimes feels that only they can hear. And I just wonder what you think about it. Because it ties with what I'm looking for. Yeah, thanks for the question, Rebecca. It's nice to meet you in person after corresponding on Twitter. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you at the conference next next month. Um, <laughs> I don't really. I, not, nothing. Nothing immediately springs to mind, and I don't have anything further to add um, from what I said before, except to say that. Um, the, the, the examples that I used in, the, in this paper today of, of people uh, renovating these houses, they would not have been in an advanced state of disrepair. So that these we're not talking about Sorry. about you know proper ruins. The point I was trying to make was this you know almost catching it before it gets to that stage. But the sense that those ruins are there as an ever-present threat, um, and the, and and to just really emphasise the amount of work that goes into for people who aren't living in the island, um, the amount of work that goes into and the amount of um, financial um, you know, commitment that is required of that. Um, so, so I just clarify that, but by all means, we'll have a conversation about that at the conference next, next month. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Jo? Can I just chip in with something? I was very interested. You're talking about one of your, one of the people that you surveyed, one of your visitors to Tyree, talking about how she took some sand and some shells and she put that somewhere, somewhere of special, you know, somewhere special in her home, and she looked at that every day. And I thought, 
actually maybe this is my reverb connection coming in here that sense of kind of spilling over natural boundaries mm. and um Tyree not being a wild place but a sort of um, desolate or a deserted place it's almost as though it's emptying out from the centre but sort of re-establishing it beyond itself beyond boundaries which I don't know if that's a sort of organic metaphor or something like mm. that but um, I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah it's a it's a it's a lovely image actually mm. isn't it and to go back to this idea of the reverb I would absolutely see that these, these homecoming events, I, I approach this very much as a process. So these are not just events that happen and are then over, but they do create this reverb, this ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice image that ties in. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Oh, we're getting some very interesting feedback from somewhere. I just ask very quickly, you um, you used um, a couple of the people you spoke to, but there was this, um, some people referred to people living in Taiwan um, that have a depth of knowledge and some who have a vague notion. Um, so this this differentiation is, is, is there some sort of, um, what's it, is there considered that one is better than the other to some extent, or is it all sort of even? acceptance I think that it's I think that it's fairly recognized that these people are on a journey and so some of the people who are considered now to be most knowledgeable and are very connected with the island in terms of you know keeping up with islanders and island news and things like that they're actually people who a decade ago I can think of one example um, who who thought that, that their Tyree ancestry was, was actually Irish. Because Tyree sounds like a, an Irish name, right? And then she did a bit of research and she found out a bit more. And then she did some more research connected with people. And so very much looking at this as a process. So again, we can go back to this reverb thing of a little bit of knowledge of pulling on that thread really ripples out. Um, so of course there are always value judgments. Um, but I, but I don't think that anyone expects you know, these people to be experts. Um, but I think just a, a little bit of that effort is, is received, in my experience, very well by residents. I just wanted to say thank you very much, Joe. It was a great talk, very interesting. Thanks, Raggy. <laughs> Okay, and this is obviously as part of your PhD. It is. It is. Uh huh. So, um, will this uh, be? Uh, will you work this up as a paper in its own, own right, or will you keep your would, powder dry and keep it for your PhD? What What, yeah. what are your plans with this? Um, I think it will. I think it will go into the thesis in some form. Mm. But as I said, ruins are just one element of heritage. I'm so interested in the yeah. intangible cultural heritage as well. Um, so it's a it's a it's a movable feast at the moment. We'll see. <laughs> I'm still still writing up, so we'll see what the final thesis ends up looking like. Okay. All right. So any final final questions or comments for Joe before we finish today? I might follow up some of your references. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Very interesting yeah. quotations, especially yeah. at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much for everybody attending today for today's um, musical presentation and Joe's seminar as well. I think it's been really, really interesting. I love these connections. That's the thing That's the thing that gets me quite excited. And I'm just going with the reverb at the minute. I'm thinking reverb <laughs> all the time. So um, I, think, I think that's our next thing, Joe. That would be our next project. But thank you, everybody. And um, do we have another one coming up before Christmas? I think summer. this is the last one and then just a conference so just to say that yes. we are having a Ruination and Decay conference in Inverness on the 11th and 12th of December um, and you can find out more about that on the website and book via Eventbrite and it's just £15 to attend or £5 if you're a student. Mm. So. And it's a wonderful eclectic mix mm -hmm. of papers and disciplines all fired up by the theme of Ruination and Decay so it is not to be missed. And, uh, and everyone is very welcome. And we'd love to see you here in Inverness. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.